This is a landscape that's exploring a style of land use management called permaculture, which is about polycultures and how to create a polyculture perennial landscape that participates with the local ecology in ways that are synergistic and optimizes off of things that we might call natural dynamics. Things like how does water flow across that land? How much sunlight comes on to that particular place for how much of the year? And what are the kinds of things that we can do with how we're feeding ourselves, how we're clothing ourselves, how we're meeting our needs that really make use of or tap into this free energy. We are in a very dynamic, high energetic system that right now we're missing a huge amount of potential harvests and yield. And what permaculture is looking at is how do we actually harvest and yield that free natural energy through things like trees, through dams, through waterworks, through buildings, with animals who are harvesting solar income as we rotate them through the landscape. What we're looking at is an educational facility and a farm and a demonstration site of a number of solution sets that we think are appropriate to this area. All kinds of different vegetation woven into the hillside here because of the fact that it has great southern exposure. So we've got black currants, Asian plums, European plums, elderberries, blueberries, a yard you really only need an area where you could maybe set up badminton, kick around a soccer ball, have a blanket. That's big enough for all of that. And these are simple ways to kind of cut down on mowing and increase the yields you can get in a suburban yard. Is look at places in your yard and say, where do I have good southern exposure and good water? And I don't need to be mowing that I could start to plant a shrub or a tree that's a fruit shrub or tree that I like to eat and that I'm buying. So shrinking simply the footprint of a yard and using the fact that yards are oftentimes great cultivation areas and not just looking at victory garden models of annual vegetables, which is important to bring back in, but in addition to bring back in fruits and nuts and berries and perennials. And the reason this ditch was dug originally was primarily to just keep the house probably from being compromised from how much water is just coming out of the hill right here. And so we saw that as a harvest opportunity, but also as a microclimate for things like the growing season of a fruit tree that's right next to a spring is going to be slightly longer because it's a slightly warmer spot because springs are like small caves so they're always 45 to 52 degrees so this is one of the key permaculture ideas of catch hold and store energy high in the system in the form of a pond because ponds the higher in the landscape they are the more gravity feeding opportunity they give you and so this is a pond that's created in a spot where nothing existed like this at all and there was no water here. After two summers of seeing this not dry up, I decided to rent an excavator and dig a pond and then plumbed it with a pipe that comes out of the dam and goes to the downhill slope and put a two inch valve at the end of that pipe that then a two inch pipe runs off of and goes downhill to a rice paddy that we'll see where it's irrigated by this pond naturally under pressure as a result of the topographical drop between where this pond is and where another series of ponds are that are downhill. Now this is water and this is an ecosystem that never existed before I came here with hand tools and with machines and dug a pond. So this is the line coming from the pond that we were just looking at. That's the high up pond in the landscape. And this is how I use it to fill other ponds that are lower in the landscape and top them off or to fill up the rice paddy that we'll look at. And you'll see that this has plenty of pressure now that you could do pretty much anything you would do with a conventional water system. So I could irrigate, I could wash clothes, I could take showers, and it's all pure gravity fed, spring fed water. And we've been rotationally grazing our chickens right around the rice paddy on the uphill side so that when it rains all of the chicken poop and the nutrients from their activity on the uphill side where the rice paddy is all gets washed in and helps to fertilize the rice and then that way also the chickens are being used to help in effect rotationally graze and get moved around this whole area and maintain the area around the rice paddy as more of a weed-free zone that's also providing fertilizer for the rice. 
So a few things that I want to point out here are a willow stand that's on our right that we've also been cutting back so that it will regrow in the way that you see it now, which is with multiple small stems, which enables us again to cut those so that then we can make baskets with them. And so wherever there's something that's wild that's growing, we're thinking either, can we use it? Does it have a benefit? Is it important habitat for something that is not having a lot of habitat around? Then we're gonna leave it. If it's none of those things, then we may cut it down and plant something else there. So here, this ditch needed to be maintained. And so turning it into a series of ponds and starting to grow vegetables and exploring chinampas and creating a coppicing willow lot all made sense here because of the fact that this is something that needed to be done. But as you'll see, we have a 14 acre property with vast areas of potential for more of this that simply are waiting to be gardened. It's where you come on out into the meadow, up through an old farm lane. Here's three ponds we created where there were small springs. And this is a root cellar that's under construction. Then you come uphill and here's a chestnut coppicing planting. So what we're looking at here is the permaculture forest garden berry farm, I call it, because what we're doing is our beds are all going across the slope, as you'll see, which makes it so when rain comes across this hillside, each one of these raised beds that has currants and raspberries and apples and pears and chestnut trees. Each one of the beds they're planted in is like a berm that helps to catch that rainwater and catch nutrients and silt and sediment so that they become fertilizer for what are planted in these rows. So again, the architecture is what makes it a permaculture berry farm, is the fact that the beds in effect are looked at as earthworks that are laid out to intercept silt sedimentation and water at the highest point in the slope possible. So this is, sited in such a manner where we're catching that silt and sediment load and the water and getting it to go into the base of plants that we're cultivating which makes them grow a lot better and do a lot better without needing to be fertilized very much. And as you come up towards the top of the hill at the highest point on the property we built a very large shed with a large roof filling a 1550 gallon rainwater catchment cistern that's the main water supply for the whole infrastructure and farm which is all downhill of that spot. So literally in a rainstorm of about one inch when we are about 15 minutes into that rainstorm this tank is filled up almost 400 gallons. In other words it's filled up almost a third of the way into a rainstorm that's a fairly large rainstorm of just a few minutes. Coming from that roof into this tank which then is higher just a little bit than this sink and then this sink when we wash our hands has skin cells in it and phosphorus and nutrients from the soap, which then goes and helps to grow elderberries and highbush blueberries from our gray water sumps. So this is the permaculture garden at the Center for Bioregional Living. And what makes it a permaculture garden are a couple things. One is how it's sited. So one of the things we paid attention to here is that it's, you can see that the beds are curving. And you can see that why they're curving is really because of the fact that they're curving to be more open to the sun and more protected from the north and from the east and the west. And this is creating an earthwork shape, which in permaculture is called a sun trap. And on the north side here, we start with our furthest north line being fruit trees. And we have peach trees, we have apricot trees, which are right now behind the sunflowers. But here you can see a peach, this is white peach, blueberry, another white peach. And that way we're making use of this northern line of the garden to cultivate something that's a perennial and a soft fruit. Soft fruits are a focus because they're very difficult to find organically. So one of the things we focus on here is cultivation without irrigation. And you can see that one of the reasons why I want to show you this melon is this is a crop that's very hard to imagine growing without irrigating. We do a lot of things preventative-wise and nutrient-wise to fill the soil health here so that originally these plants don't really need any inputs in order for them to do well because we've set the groundwork and the architecture of the soil. And so these beds are all raised 
permanent raised beds. We never changed the location of the beds and the tractor and the pickup truck, which I bring in to do things like till the soil and turn in amendments, never have their tires in the bed and all straddle the layout of the bed. That way it has excellent porosity. And then in the beds, we sow white clover and leguminosae plants that help to fix nitrogen to help to fertilize the beds at the root zone but they also help with rainwater infiltration, which is the main reason we're able to grow really beautiful succulents like melons without any irrigation. Chard and kale really need to be harvested regularly and kind of aggressively in terms of the leaves. It's a plant that really responds. You don't want to leave leaves on your plant that don't really look great because and your plants put an energy into a leaf that doesn't really look great. What, what's the point of that? So in a chard or a kale, you always want to tear off leaves that don't look good and then eat all the ones that look good. If they have a few holes in them, we keep them for ourselves. That way this chard plant is putting its energy into only growing beautiful, perfect looking leaves. Perfect ones I'll sell to restaurants, the ones with holes we eat for ourselves. So this is our outdoor shower that's gravity fed from the tank way up the hill and we built it with cedar posts from on site. So you can see these posts are all cut from on site and then those are what the framing lumber is attached to. And we used a rock as the central floor that was already here and in the ground and just set the posts in right around the edge of the rock and framed up the building to fit around this natural rock that was here as really a beautiful natural feature and just a nice spot to be able to stand outside and take a shower in a place where the water is just coming from goes straight up the hill and is gravity feeding and coming down here under high pressure. So this is our outdoor wood-fired hot water heater which is a totally renewable natural resource that's solar grown called wood that we use in this landscape to heat the water. And you just start a little fire in here inside the firebox. And because the water jacket is right around it, you have really hot water in about three to five minutes. Go further out, we'll build a stage, um, larger school, lecture hall, teaching space, perhaps some future year-round housing. Definitely several three-season cabins 